Hello and welcome to Head Above the Clouds podcast with me, Alice G. And me, Jay Poltney. We're here to have open and honest conversations about mental illness and hopefully give some advice about how to keep your head above the clouds. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Head Above the Clouds podcast. I hope you've all had a good week. I know the recent announcements around our Christmas plans probably haven't been the most brilliant way to end the year, but I hope as many of you as possible can get to be around the ones you love. And for those of you that can't, we know things may get incredibly difficult and incredibly lonely. So in the description of this episode, we've linked to some amazing services that can be there for you and your mental health over this really difficult time. This week, we've got another amazing guest who joined us for a little chat. But first, I want to tell you about a super exciting project that we've been working on during lockdown. The second issue of our magazine is out today actually, which is really exciting. We have four incredible cover stars, Declan McKenna, B. Miller, Gabrielle Alpin and The Wombats. We've got interviews with Jade Bird, Cabbage, Flight and Black Honey. A really interesting insight to what it's been like as a student living in halls over this first term of university, as well as a rundown of the music, TV and books that we've been living for in 2020. The last remaining copies of our first issue, which came out in August and featured The Hunter, Tom Grennan, Sports Team and Bang Bang Romeo, are still available and anyone who cops one between now and the end of the year will be entered into a prize draw to win some fun signed goodies. You can get your copy from our website, the link will be in the episode description as well as over on all of our socials. This week we are joined by international footballer Stephen Colker. Stephen started his professional career with Tottenham Hotspur back in 2009 and has since played for Bristol, Swansea, Queen's Park Rangers and my own team Liverpool before moving to the Turkish Super League. We got to have a really frank and honest talk about his past issues with addiction and gambling, his desire to help people get out of these incredibly difficult situations and how mental illness is treated in the world of football. It was an incredibly interesting chat, which you guys can hear right now. Hi guys, right? Hi, how's the weather in Turkey? Still good, to be fair. I don't want to make you too jealous. But yeah. It's, yeah, it's like 20, 25 degrees during the day, so it's nice. nice. This week we're joined by Stephen Hawker. Nice to meet you. And we're so glad you're here all the way from Turkey. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. You're most welcome. We are joined, as per usual, by Alice G, that's me, and me, Jade Poltney. And we're going to be talking to Stephen about his experiences with mental health. Um, And of course, we'll be, I'm sure we'll be talking about football at some point. Um, so let's let's drive. Let's go straight away. Dive in, and why not start with your your professional career? You started obviously at Tottenham Hotspur um, under 18s, which is an incredible team to to begin with. You know, a lead Premiership team. I was quite fortunate, to be fair, to end up there. I, I had many trials as a as a youngster. Um, got rejected by a lot of clubs. Actually, I'd been on trial at. Been on trial at Chelsea, I've been on trial at QPR, I've been on trial at Southampton, um, many, many, Brentford, many, many clubs. And um, I was always so nervous when I turned up. I was just so nervous, I was unable to perform. Um, and the Tottenham one sort of came out of nowhere. I remember going to the trial, I went straight from school, which was, I, was, I was in school in West London. It was a long drive to get around there. I think I'd eaten Burger King or something on the way to the to the trial. Uh, I turned up in the wrong boots. I brought studs thinking was out on the pitch, was actually on the, the, the 3G pitch at the time. And I had to borrow the academy manager's boots. So it was compared to my other trials where I'd gone like a week, like perfect sleeping, eating, drinking, correct, all of that. This was very much off the cuff, just turn up and play. And it, it worked, you know, that actually worked, that sort of freedom. Um, yeah, it, I, got, I got signed after, well, in the first week, I did one training session, one match, I got signed and um, I just felt right at home there, really. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a little awkward, obviously, borrowing the academy manager's boots on the day, but, you know, he saw the funny side of it and, um, you know, we still have a great relationship today. Do you think then, 
I mean, uh, maybe a different approach because you were less, I don't know, obviously when you ha- you know things are coming up and you p- plan for them and you want everything to be perfect. Do you think that maybe that was kind of why it went so well because you weren't, not so prepared, but do you know what I mean? You weren't necessarily thinking, o- overthinking it. That's exactly it, yeah. When I overthink anything, it tends to go wrong. And that was no different as a child. You know, I was uh, I was scared going on trial, you know, because I always wanted to be a footballer. So it meant so much to be invited to these trials that I'd go there and I just I just got so nervous. And uh, it's also difficult, you know, you've got all the boys there in their, you know, Tottenham kit, QBR kit, Southampton kit, wherever it may be. And you're there in just your shorts and a t-shirt, you know, that your mum's the only pair you've got clean from, from your mum's washing. And you just, you just, you just feel odd. You know what I mean? You feel the odds went out and you are in such a, some, some degree, the odds went out, you know, they all know each other and it's hard walking into any academy. I think um, what's great is um, Chris Ramsey, who, who also was part of signing me at, at Tottenham. He, um, he says like when he brings the youngster in a trial, he, he looks at them for a while because he knows the pressure they're under when they first walk in. You're not going to get a, a true reflection of actually what they're about. So, yeah, it's important that I think like, coaches and the academy spend a bit of time looking at these players before they just make a quick decision. So where did you go to the trials? To the first team there watching you? No, so it was in an evening. So the first team would normally would typically train in the morning. Um, it was just, I think it was under under 15 I signed, under 15s, just before the under 16s year um, I signed. So it was fairly late as well. I mean, it was at the stage where my mum had said, look, you know, you have to start thinking about what you're going to do school-wise because um, my GCSEs were coming up the following year and I still hadn't got signed anywhere. I'd had many trials, but hadn't been signed. So... Yeah, there was quite a lot of pressure, I think, you know, to sort of like, which way am I going to go? I was also in athletics at the time. I, I loved the 800 metres and used to run quite a decent time. So was was running for the county and national trials and stuff for that. So it's kind of like, you know, which way am I going to go? Is it the athletics? Is it school? Or is it football? Um, and thankfully, the, the football, you know, I got that opportunity when I did. And um, yeah, within a couple of months, we was we was training with the first team, which was, which was just surreal. I mean, Tottenham were a massive club, but still are a massive club, arguably a bigger club today. And it was all just so exciting to be a part of. Do you know what, though? I think it's there must have been like huge amounts of pressure because obviously being a teenager, as we all know, is not necessarily the funnest part in, in your, your life and growing up. And I think when you've got pressure of like school and what you, you, you've been told basically that you have to figure out overnight for some exams, what you want to do with your life. So the pressure must've been pretty, pretty unreal when it came to wanting to do the sport in versus all of a sudden being told, maybe I'll have to look at other options. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And football was honestly, when I say it was, I was upset, I was obsessed with it. I mean, I, I say openly, it was probably my first ever addiction. You know, I mean, I, I played football day until night and it was always what I wanted to do. It was always who I wanted to be. So I put so much into that. It was frightening that I may never realise my dreams. It was frightening, but it was quite the contrary, to be honest with you. It was like I got signed, I said, late on as 15, just for, just for my 16th birthday. And within five years, I was playing for England. You know what I mean? It, it really rocketed. And it was, um, that was quite surreal also. Do you mean? It was like, I kind of never had time to breathe. I've had more time these last few years to actually sit back and go, wow, like, I did this and I did that. And at the time, you just always think about the next game. So it just, it literally just, just goes by so quick. Because I'm sure you hear many sort of ex-players, retired players talk about you really have to like enjoy the moment, but that goes for life in general. The way I try to live my life today is I try to be present and enjoy every moment, you know, because I so said, I'm, I'm talking here about when I was 15, I'm now 28. Do you mean the 13 years have, have, have just flo- flown by? What was it like then? I guess, as you said, like you, you went from being, I mean, you were really young when this first happened and to be kind of catapulted. I think, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I'm not a, I'm not a footballer, but I can imagine to be like catapulted into the limelight, especially like playing that young for England and other teams. The pressure of going from day to day to almost like in the limelight must have been, must have been huge. Like obviously, yeah. It was, I did it step by step. So I, I was, I really loved the way Tottenham sort of, worked with me if you like so at the age of 17 they loaned me out to Yeovil who were in League One at the time got a season long experience there which was amazing learned to learn to play under pressure learn to play with crowds learn to play with people who are you know fighting for their mortgage payments you know they want to win that win bonus is important um, 
So it felt very real. Do you know what I mean? That was very real. Whereas academy football, you're very much protected. The result doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. As soon as you go into first team football, the results matter. Do you know what I mean? It matters to, to the fans. It matters to the club. It matters financially, et cetera, et cetera. So I had that in, in League One. Then I went on to Bristol City in the Championship. And then the following year, I went to the Premier League with Swansea. So I kind of had a step-by-step introduction. I and mean, by my fourth year, I was taken back to Tottenham. So by the time I'd got to that level where people are recognising you in the street and you're getting England call-ups, etc. I sort of had that three years through League One Championship and, and Swansea, the, obviously the other end of the Premier League, where it sort of eased me into it. So I was quite, I was quite fortunate for that. I look at some players today, and from the age of 16, 17, they just rock it to the top. I mean, that person who springs to mind the most was um, on my England debut at the age of 20. Uh, Raheem Sterling made his debut the same day, and I remember he was 17. Do you know what I mean? And I look at him today and, I mean, my hat goes off to him. Do you know what I mean? He's managed to stay at that level for that long. It's incredible. And he's taken a lot of stick along the way. So I think people obviously underestimate how difficult it is to be an Ashley Cole, Rio Ferdinand, Raheem Sterling, Wayne Rooney, who stay at the top for that long. Um, I think in any sport, do you know what I mean? I think, I think it's truly, truly an incredible achievement. I think it's also like really different for us fans, you know, because we just see the kind of polished match. I mean, I, I'm, I, I enjoy football. I'm technically an Arsenal fan, so don't, don't you know, get me for that. But when you go watch the match, everything's kind of well put together. It's already slick. So we don't see that, that whole growing up in it. We don't see that fight, as you say, for your mortgage. We don't think about that. We just see it as a, as a game. I know people are very passionate about it. Um, but, I mean, I don't know about Jade, because she's also a football fan. Yeah, I mean, I have some sort of insight because my brother used to play for Everton Academy when he was young. And as much as it disappointed my dad, because we are lifelong Liverpool fans in this house, (laughs) he got scouted about nine, eight, nine years old. And he was the goalkeeper at Everton's youth team for a bit. And it is sort of weird. Like they were like media training eight year olds on how to like, just in case they do make their way up to the main team, like you need to know how to act in interviews. You need to be on your best behavior 24 seven. And I think that was more the element that my brother couldn't handle than the actual playing of the sport. He was like, I don't think I want to have my face on like newspaper front covers. I don't really want kids with my name on the back of their shirt. That's so much pressure. And he ended up leaving after like, I think three, four years. Many do. Many do. It's, it's, I mean, for me, it's quite sad. I mean, most people I've spoken to, you know, who've been through the academies, who never made it, either didn't want to make it or, or wasn't quite good enough, whatever reason, there's multiple, multiple reasons why somebody doesn't go from from an academy player to a, to a first team player. But a lot of them, like, looking back, they just, it, it's got, I mean, I personally, it's quite sad. I, I know many players who, at the age of 18 or at the end of your scholarship at 18 or the end of, you say, a pro contract, 19, 20, who are getting told look, appreciate your time, appreciate what you've done for us for the last 10 years, i.e. your brother, I could have been there from the age of eight, all the media training, all of the, the academy training and all the journeys your parents are making because it's it's a big sacrifice your parents are making. And oh, yeah, like every get- Saturday, Sunday, I was sort of yeah. left on my own. My mum and dad were taking my brother up and down the country to games and they played at Wembley one weekend and I had a netball game the same weekend and they were like, sorry, he's playing at Wembley, you're playing at the school gym. I was like, yeah. yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Priorities, priorities, yeah. No, yeah. I understand you, and that like that's the dilemma I think for any, well, any parents with with multiple children. Do you know what I mean it's 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 an issue that, that they face for sure. The same with my brother. You know, I, the first thing I did when I had enough money, as in an in income, because obviously League One, you're not earning obviously crazy money. But by the time I got to the Premier League, the first thing I did was was able to, to buy my parents and, and family a house, and that was something I always wanted to do to sort of like give back to show my appreciation. I mean. You do it more so with your with your words and your actions than just by buying a gift. But it was just it was just something that I'd always dreamt of, and it was something that was yeah, it was nice when I was able to like accomplish that and be able to be able to do that. Because I said that it's it's not just the one person who makes it. Okay, in some cases it is, but the majority of the time, the coaches are playing a part, your family's playing a part, your friends at the schools because the school. I mean, my school was was great. They let me go out on day release one day a week. It was it was going out to the academy um, and getting experience as a first team player. You know, the school didn't have to let me go. I mean, they didn't have to let me take that day off to go and experience that, but they did. And 
they they encouraged it if anything you know so that was nice that was that was you know really nice um i just you know a lot of people are, are still close with from the youth team days up it can be challenging for a lot of people um when you just I said you what you do when you're when you're 18 you know you put your whole childhood into this football um your school work has obviously been affected i, I think most people don't admit that i mean naturally it happened you're training three nights a week you're missing one day of school um where do you go from there and a lot of them uh well in my experience a lot of my old teammates become become a sticky situation and you know it took me a, a good few years to to find themselves do you think because of that, I mean, if we're being really real about it, and the pressure, obviously you had the media training, which is great. Um, I had a similar thing with my music, but do you think that had a part to play in your mental health struggles? Or was it, or do you think maybe um, like the idea of being pre predisposed? So it's like for me, I've got bipolar. I was probably more predisposed before the pressures that came. But do you think that, that had a you know role to play in in where the addiction started coming in. I would say it definitely fueled it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I would say it, definitely, it definitely played a part in in fueling um, the addictions. I mean, obviously the money for starters. You know, it, it, the money that was coming in, I was able to gamble freely. Um, I, I obviously gambled more than more than my income was, and that's 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 the life of a gambler. But it constantly sort of just like refueled me to continue um, with my addictions. And it took many, many years for me to me to tackle them. And the reason being is when you're sort of so successful, so to speak, um, as a youngster, it's very difficult for your mum and dad to pull you aside and, and, and tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. It's also very difficult for, for a coach to do that. You know, it, you, my ego was up, um, you know, in a way it has to be, you know, when you're, when you're competing, you're in a rat race, you know, you're competing, not everyone's going to make it from the academy. You know, you figure how many people get rejected from the academy and then from the academy, how many make it through to the youth team, then from the youth team to the first, it's, it's a, it's a very, very slim chance. So it's a rat race. Everyone's competing against each other. So I would say that competitive competitiveness was great when I channeled it, but when I was unable to channel it, it you know, it brought many, many problems and, I think you see that in a lot of guys today. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's, a, there's an edge towards them, but that edge also helps them on the pitch. Do you know what I mean? It, it brings in some some great performances. So I think it's just about finding a balance. And, you know, I spoke the other day in an interview and it's just all about, you know, education. You know, the coaches are sort of, you know, doing their best for guys who are struggling, but they're doing it from the knowledge that they have. And unfortunately, it's fairly limited unless they've experienced it, you know, bipolar like yourself. I mean, I wouldn't sit here and, try to comment on what you should and shouldn't do because I have no experience <clears throat> with bipolar. And that's very similar with the coaches. You know, they're in, they're in that sort of situation where how can they talk about the gambling and the drink if they don't know it themselves? So I think education is key. Um, and I think it could definitely be a lot more widespread, you know, worldwide and it, and especially in sport. I think also like, even if people intervene, I know when I was younger and I was, I started having the issue with drugs and the addiction, like, as much as people try and intervene and tell you what you should do and shouldn't do and that it's dangerous and that you're pushing the limit, it's something that even if you promise, I, I mean, for me, I just went back to again and again and again, like no matter how many promises or how much I kind of wanted to change, it was something that you once you're in it, you, you just, it's a repetitive cycle. That's what I found at least. I don't know if you found that as well. Definitely. In order to break the cycle, I mean, it took me nearly 10 years. So it took me nearly 10 years. And I'll say for seven of those years, everyone was telling me, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that, do this. Do that. It, it was impossible. You know, one of, one of the biggest things, you know, talking about the, the, the effect that football had on, on, say, my mental health was, football, I guess, was my identity for so many years. As a youngster, everyone knew me as a footballer. You know what I mean? That was, that was who it is. I mean, I'm going for a similar situation, situation now with my niece. She's amazing at football. So it's like any time the family around, it's like, how are you doing at football? How is it? Before you ask, how are you? It's, how's the football going? How's it? You know, and people are genuinely interested. They're excited about it. But it's easy to lose yourself within that. And I think that definitely happened to me and as, as it happens to many other people. And, you know, during that sort of like process of losing myself, being told by many coaches, do this and do that and do it, you, you sort of lose your instinct, you know, on the pitch and off the pitch. And, that, that definitely, you know, was a thing for me. I'd say when I you know, eventually dropped my knees and surrendered uh, around the age of 24, 25, I didn't have a clue who I was. I had no idea who I was. I had the beautiful opportunity to start a game from fresh, but 
also it was sad. You know I mean, it was, it was sad to, to, you know, to, to be in that state. So yeah, I, c- I could definitely relate to, to people, you know, giving all their suggestions, etc. But until I was ready, it, it, it was irrelevant, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, I think it's a tricky one either way. And I think also when you're in your 20s, I mean, me and Jade were speaking about this recently, how we're watching everyone we kind of know either settle down or like be a certain position in their job. I mean, we both work in the music industry, um, which is a, a notorious industry for just being difficult in itself. And we're literally watching all these people, whether they're having kids or they're settling down. And I think you hit this point where like, You've, not only are you questioning like your own choices and your own future, but you don't. There is a point where you have like an identity crisis. I mean, I think your twenties. Well, I, I know they call it a midlife crisis, but I'm pretty sure like it's a thing having them in your twenties. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I mean, I can relate for sure. Yeah, I can relate. I mean, I guess what I would say is other people don't have it till later if they don't have the consequences. You know, my consequences were huge. They stopped me in my tracks early. Uh, I mean. 26 to get sober and 26 is actually quite young you know believe it or not thank god there's guys who are younger who get in the room but a lot of the guys don't get it to the 35 40 mid 40s you know a lot later so they always sound blessed to get it earlier as are you as are you guys and um but yeah I, I, again you know there's a lot of identification there we have very similar problems but you know we can we can uh you know we can relate I just relate on that emotional level you know that just just having that I thought, for me, it was always that like pressure to change. You know, everyone, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why can't you just be different? And um, I ask myself that every night. I really, really wish I could. You know, I didn't put myself through this through choice. You know, what I mean, I, I wouldn't have chose to cause as much pain as I did to to those around me and myself through choice. You know, um, but it took me a while to accept that. You know, there was times I questioned if I was a bad person, and um, you know, they, they were dark times. They were challenging times. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been a, I don't want to say trend, but it's definitely something I've noticed lately. A lot of the bigger Premier League clubs are now pushing mental health awareness within the team and they've set up all these initiatives and not just within the team, but in the wider community. I know Liverpool do some, Chelsea have been doing some as well. What could they do? Like, What do they need to implement at that level in order to actually help particularly the young members of this team who, you know, like you said, you're 16, you're coming into it all of a sudden, you've got a shit ton of money, loads of girls probably throwing themselves around you and you're probably like, this is sick. And then someone coming in and going, actually, you need to like calm down a bit and like even out. What do you think these clubs should be doing? Um, Again, I I think, you know, it boils back to the education of of, of the coaching staff, you know, like, the coach or the manager, I should say, you know, has, has a big role, you know, it's a big responsibility. I, you know, the, the name in itself, the manager, you know, your idea is to manage the team and there's lots of individuals and you have to bring them together and, and it's a difficult job. The club could start by giving managers more time, which in, in turn would allow them to feel more freedom and to invest more time in individuals. That's definitely something I, I see today. I mean, managers are getting sacked after five, six games. That's no time to come in and have an impact on a, on a 17 year old coming through. It's impossible. Um, so I'll definitely start with that. And, and, and the education, um, you know, as part of their badges, can they do a form of therapy? Can they do a course on it? I don't know. There's many um, stuff that could be spoken about. You know, I don't think there's any obvious one answer. I think it's, it's, I think it's, people coming together, you know, brainstorming and using ideas, trial and error, what's working, what's not. Um, but the positive to take from, you know, what you just said is they are starting to look for solutions, you know, and that's that's a change. That's a, that's a positive motion. Um, but I'd say, you know, they're still, you know, a, a quite a long way off that. Um, yeah, there's still a stigma about it. But is that just in sport? I don't know. I, I would ask you, I mean, it, I would say arguably it's outside of sport as well. I wouldn't just say it's football. Mm-hmm. I think, okay, people are coming a little bit more accepted. I've just joined social media and I, and I see on Instagram now there's quite a lot of stuff around mental health. It seems to be more acceptable and, I don't know, trending, if you like. I mean, it's, you know, but um, mm-hmm. I still think the true depth of it is still some way away from being understood. Honestly, I think that I agree. I think there's a big trend and I agree. It's amazing 
I mean, I first got ill when I was 12, so that was, what, over 10 years ago. And at the time, I mean, it's nothing like compared to the 60s, but at the time there was no conversation about it. There was no support, big stigma. And I think although at the moment it is being talked about more and that's amazing, I think we're at this, like, real rut where talking is great, but it's actions that are going to really change this. Um, And I think, I I don't know, obviously I'm not in the football industry, but I know with the music industry and the media industry that it's, they each have their own like little areas with it and their own little kind of ways they're trying to help or their own ways that they're struggling with it. Um, And I think it's a really difficult thing to manage because it's so, so personal. Everyone's experience is completely different. And I think when it comes to it, that it's great. It's, I, I think it's great that the that the um, the teams are trying, you know, giving it a good go to start. Um, but hopefully, I mean, it's finding the the right approach and the right way to deal with it. But I do, I can't even imagine what it's like to be part of a team that is your life and to have like managers come in and out and different players come in and out. Like, there's no stability. I would imagine to that. Yeah, and. and- you know, that's, I knew the way that was going, what you were about to say, and I, I was smiling because, yeah, the stability, you know, you go to any psychiatrist, any therapist, any recovery group, and a lot of them talk about stability, oh, you need some stability. And it's like, okay, cool. As a 17-year-old, I moved to Yeovil, which was two or three hours away from my house. Then the next year, I was about to go to Leeds. Then I went to Bristol. From Bristol, I went to Swansea. Swansea, back to London. London to Cardiff. The list goes on. Do you know I mean, I can exhaust you with places I've gone around around the globe, you know, I'm now sat in Turkey, you know, I did a time in Scotland. It, it's, it's so, it's so, um, it's so up and down, you know, results, the results every week are up and down, you're in and out of the team, you're playing, you're not playing, you know, you, you mentioned earlier about people just, you, you sort of look at the polished arc of it, you know, the, the, the 11 players on the pitch, you're looking at that side of it, you know, you're also forgetting that the guys who are on the bench, you know, the guys who don't even make the bench, who have travelled, who have put all the work in, how is that affecting them? I can tell you firsthand that affects a lot of guys, you know, that feeling of not being good enough. You know, what does what does that tell you if you're not even on the bench? You know, it, it's a very hard thing to take. I mean, I personally go and put my arm around a lot of players today who are out of the squad, who are out of the bench, you know, who aren't getting their chance because I know firsthand how that feels. And that's where I think, you know, the coaches, I mean, they've had it. A lot of them have been ex-players, but they seem to, to forget it. As I said, whether it's the pressure, whether it's the, the lack of time, they seem to forget what it's like to be a player and a player who's very much on the outskirts. So that, again, is a good example there of, of where just an arm around you, just someone to connect with, communicate with, someone to relate relate to you, somebody to encourage you. You know, there's, there's a guy here at the moment, he's only 20, amazing player, just hasn't been given his chance. I don't know why. He's probably questioned every day why. But, you know, a few of the senior boys have got a really good bunch of players who will come and say to them, look, keep going, keep working hard, blah, blah, you know, your chance is going to come. I never really had that as a youngster. Do you know what I mean, I never really had that. I guess when you're six foot three, everyone always expects you are, you're big, you're strong, you can deal with it. But I couldn't. I was extremely sensitive. You know, on the outside, I looked aggressive and this, but I was just a sensitive young child. Do you know what I mean? And um, the lack of stability definitely, you know, doesn't help anybody with, um, you know, with mental health issues. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a good point. I'm sure you know, from, as you mentioned, it's really nice to hear you say like recovery groups and stuff like that. I think a lot of people, I mean, I'm personally, I love them. I live for them groups. I really look forward to them. They really help me like because the mentorship, um, you know, when I, I'm what, I'm 25 with bipolar and I've had 10 years of it. But there's people out there with like, you know, 40 years on. So to have that mentorship is great. But I'm sure you know from them groups that stability is is the thing like, there's a few for instance bipolar there's a few things um in a triangle they call it to balance out and to keep the triangle like as a shape you have to have good sleep good therapy and medication for most people and as soon as you break that the like the triangle collapses um so I honest to god like hats to you I don't know how you can like when you move around that much from team to team from people to people how you can find any stability in that especially at the age of like 20 it's just, it's madness. It, it, it definitely is challenging and I'm not the only guy going through it. I said there's millions of, of young players going through it uh, in, in other sports as well. Um, what, I, what I found works for me was, you know, I 
developed a relationship with God of my understanding. You know, that's a big part of the 12-step 12 12 step fellowship. And, um, you know, prayer and meditation, you know, for me, really helps centre me. So I don't rely on other people to tell me how good or bad I was today or where I'm living. I just, you know, I, I turn to God. That, that's what I use. You know, other people who may, you know, may not be believing in God, you know, they use a higher power of their choice, you know, the sea, the trees, something that's going to be there forever, you know, and never changes, you know, something there to to fall back on and and you know that I think that's that's a big big part of my recovery without doubt because there's times where I'm questioning everything and I'm not sure why this is happening and why is that happening but when I just calm myself down and, and remind myself control what I can control it eases the pressure because a lot of the things I stress about are outside of, of my control I can't actually do anything about them um just one thing you mentioned the music industry and uh mm. You know, I love, love, love music. Like, I love connecting with music and there's so many amazing artists out there. I never thought I would say I'm a believer, but genuinely <laughs> his music is like, is unreal. At, at this moment in time, some of the music he's putting out, I mean, the song Lonely, I just connect with it on another level, you know, and I think it's so powerful because a lot of what you see in football is ex-footballers talk about it. They don't talk about it when they're current because it very much affects your career. I'm a good example of that. Aaron Lennon's a good example of that. You know, we both had to come to Turkey in order to get opportunities, you know, after speaking out publicly and obviously having our um, our issues publicly. So I think there's still a bit of a stigma back home. So to be courageous enough to come out and do what he does, I think is amazing. Of course, music industry is slightly different to sport, but regardless, I think people like him, J. Cole, NF, you know, to name a few, are just people who who are living it, you know, they have to be living it because to speak how they speak, they speak a certain language, which, you know, you guys and myself can understand. How do I you... Think... Oh, go ahead, Jay, you go. Sorry. Yeah. I think that, you know, we talk about having these issues. I think it's weird to say it's lucky, but I do think me and Alice have had some luck in the fact that we have chosen to work in a more creative industry where people are a bit more open-minded and a bit more sort of maybe liberal thinking and like engaging in mental health conversations and growing up in a northern working class town and going to football matches from when I was a kid it's a very different environment and that sort of macho bravado atmosphere even you know my dad he's very chilled out in the house but as soon as he walks into that stadium it's like something else overcomes him and you become part of this really like ugh, sort of group of people and I do think you see it in football not with just mental health but with LGBTQ issues and race there is the sort of stigma of like you are a footballer and you will play football and you will score goals and that's it we don't want to hear about anything else definitely definitely agree with you and I had it when I well doing things like this you know you I often get the the one oh, how can you be looking for self-pity like you've earned this much money that it's like that's the complete opposite to what I'm looking for do you know I mean it's like that like I've wallowed in enough pity of uh, my own pity over the years do you know I mean I don't want self-pity from any, from anybody else you know and part of why we speak about it is to make others feel less alone because if you've been where you know we've been you know what it feels like to be lonely. You know, you know what it truly feels like. And, um, you know, that feeling I wouldn't wish on anybody. And which is why I think, like I said, communicating with people, educating people, the more openly we speak about it, the more comfortable it becomes in society. And I think, you know, I think I think it's definitely heading in the right direction, as I said earlier, but it's still a long way to go. And, um, you know, I think obviously what you guys are doing is great. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, the more people who, who do it, who put themselves out there, the better, you know, because I know many people who suffer in silence and, um, you know, it's difficult to watch. How, I'd love to know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how has your son kind of fitted into all of this? And I'm sure that is a huge, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I would imagine it's like a huge drive to want to change things and progress in a different way. For sure, yeah. I mean, you know, looking back, I didn't like the person who I was at all, you know, and today I'm able to be a better father, a better son, a better brother, a better friend, a better human being. And um, it's so important for me to be able to, to be present whilst I'm with my son and not be with him, but hung over or with him, but, you know, got a gambling debt in the back of my mind or a bet I've got to do, you know, so to actually be present with him and engage with him is amazing. And I'm, I'm honest and open with him, you know, he's only nine, but, I tell him, like, he says, oh, you're in Turkey. And I, I tell him, like, I'm in Turkey 
you know, I, because I did X, Y, and Z, you know, I, I unfortunately wasn't able to get a grip of it younger, you know, and, you know, things have consequences, actions have consequences, you know, and one thing leads to the other. And, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful to be here with this fresh opportunity, but it, it's difficult. It's difficult being away from my son, of course, you know, like if I never had these issues and I maintained my career in England at Tottenham when I first started or whatever, you know, my son would be right next to me. So, that's a consequence that I have to live with, um, you know, for, for however long I'm here for. And um, of course, we made the best of the situation. He's over here for holidays. We have a great time. And um, like I said, the most important thing is for me, I can look my son and my parents in the eye and they know I'm trying to be the best I could be. I give them everything I've got and they know that and it's genuine and it's pure. So that is what's priceless for me. You know, that I couldn't put a, a price on it. I, I, I couldn't say to you, oh, you know, that that's made this whole you know journey worthwhile and and continues to make it worthwhile you know it, the journey doesn't end here I, i've tried to to set on a daily basis you know when i'm with him i will sit down and even do our prayers you know and I, I want to give him some sort of understanding of, of gratitude and um it's very easy to give him everything oh i miss him so much let me just give him everything but you know i want to kind of teach him some balance in life and um I've got a lot of experience, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I'm able to, to share that with him. And, you know, for that, I'm very grateful. I think it's, do you know what? I think, although you say consequence, and I get that, I've been there where I, I look at the consequence, I just think, although, like, you've you've turned something really on its head, like, and you're given, to be able to give him, so, like, as a father, like, that time where, and that understanding where you, you get, you understand what it's like to go from the the you know where you don't deal with this stuff to managing it I think that's a really a great a really great thing personally um and I think that's what any parent would want I mean I, I hope in the future that's something that I would give my kids so it's a nice way to look at it in a in a weird way yeah no, um, definitely. so I was just going to say it's also nice to be able to to actually connect with somebody and ask, how are you feeling? Do you know what I mean? Because I don't think I ever got asked that really as a youngster, you know, how are you feeling? Do you know what I mean? Even in today's society, like, you don't really, you know, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, good, thanks. But if you actually write something, how are you feeling? You know, it connects with them a lot more, you know, like, how are you actually feeling? How are you, feel? like, rather than telling him off when he's in trouble at school or something, say, oh, what, what are you feeling when you did? And, you know, like, it's really interesting to learn and watch him develop as he speaks about his emotions and, you know, learns about himself. You know, that's, that's, for that's part of my duty, you know, is to, it's obviously guided him into being the best version of himself. You know, that's 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 what I hope to do. Sorry, I thought Jade was going to say something. No, bit. I was just moving to myself. <laughs> um, so obviously this year has been, I mean, 2020 has been <laughs> one hell of a year with, if you, you know, want to focus on Corona. What would you, I guess we we almost ask our, um, our guests what they're kind of looking forward to. I guess with Corona, putting things into perspective, anything's slightly better, I would imagine. But um, what are you looking forward to? And hopefully, let's go with 2021, a good start. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to give you a boring answer and say I take it a day at a time, but, but it's the <laughs> truth. I do generally try to take it a day at a time. You know, I said with like the whole recovery program and stuff, that's what works best for me. But if I'm thinking outside the box, you know, I, I, I'm, my contract's up. Next summer, um, the club have offered me a new contract at the moment. Um, I've decided not to sign. So I would really like to, to you know, go back and play at the top level, you know, whether that be Serie A, whether that be Bundesliga, whether that be back home in the Premier League, I don't know. But I would really like to to compete in, um, you know, one of the European top leagues. Um, it, that's something that excites me, something I look forward to. And international football, you know, they're, they're sort of two things, they're my sort of like two ambitions, if you like, on the pitch. Um, and off the pitch, I want to, you know, obviously continue my sobriety a day at a time um, and, you know, help others. I just think that, you know, I've only recently found my voice, I guess, if you like. You know, I spent many years uh, undercover, just working on myself, do you know what I mean? And just, just completely like disconnecting from social media and all that kind of stuff. And, I guess like over the next year or so, I would like to to actually make a difference. I don't know what that looks like today, but um, you know, I hope that you know, with with my experience, I can I can share with others and, and make a difference. So, yeah, step by step, that's yeah. I guess that's uh, that's work in progress. That's a rich, you know, what? it's a lovely, it's a really nice outlook. Um, really, really lovely outlook, and it's not easy. 
and especially when you're in an industry where it's all fueled about being a man and the kind of toxic masculinity I can't even imagine that big you know begins with that one and finding your voice so um I think that's a really nice outlook um something I've when you are a youngster and you get signed to a big club and then they sort of loan you out to smaller ones does that feel a bit like oh I got signed and then oh I'm not actually playing with the club I got signed for does it that sort of affect your mood and your mental health being like oh I wanted to play for this team but they're sort of loaning me out to a smaller league one league two sort of team does that affect it, your health in any way mental health it, it, it can I mean it, it didn't affect me I mean I, it was mine was almost like a positive move do you know what I mean it was like it was only me and a couple of other of the youth team players who, who got to take advantage of the loan system so for me, it, it was it, they, they were all positive moves, but I, I could see I could see your point. I think I think if you're if you're slightly older, I think it's actually more of an issue. As a youngster, you're just excited to go and play mm. to play league football. Well, I mean, it's it's incredible. So, but I think if you're slightly older, that that feeling of rejection, you know, what I mean, of, of not being good enough again, you know, the club not what you know that that could be tricky, I guess. And I, it, it's personal to to every individual. Some guys go there and think, oh yeah, I, I'm the big I am. I come from this club. You know, I am. You know, some guys go like that and they get smashed in the first game, and you know, it's a wake up call. And other guys go there and you know they're very much in awe of of first team players. It's like, oh, well, this is my chance. And so it, it depends very much on the individual. Uh, me personally, um, I said my low moves were always positive ones. So. So that 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 didn't necessarily affect me, but um, you know, definitely have been uh, I've been not unsigned by clubs. You know, I've been in situations where you know I did a loan spell at Southampton, did a loan spell by Liverpool, and at the time neither of them wanted to continue. So I've had that sort of rejection, if you like, but I never had it the other way. Mm. I think one last thing I must ask, and it's probably more of a personal thing. Obviously, like you spend your whole life training, um, how much? of a burden and a real worry is is kind of being injured how I'm just I'm just intrigued because obviously you would imagine it's pretty a big dread that you train all your life like athletes do and then there's that risk is that something that really plays into kind of the worries of playing or is it just something that is it's a matter of fact it's, it's a matter of fact to tell you the truth but definitely in my head anyway it's not something that I fear um, touch wood it's it's something that I think happens to mostly everybody throughout their career some are, are luckier than others and, and some are, are really unfortunate with their injuries um, I think obviously the better you take care of your body the less likely you are to get a muscle injury but you know that can't stop a, a broken leg or a, or a knee injury so um, it, it's not something that we can control I think um, you know it's something that unfortunately happens at the wrong time for many people, um, especially as a youngster, it can be really damaging, you know, it can really close many doors. So um, I think that just is, is almost down to fate, if you like. I feel like I've really jinxed that now. I'm a bit of a funny person when it comes to <laughs> touch the wood, please. Uh, that'd be great. But we're just yeah. going to sign off because um, we've, we've, you've literally covered everything really beautifully and, and more actually. Um, cool. So we normally just end by saying um, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah. we've really, really enjoyed talking to you and learning a little bit more about the football industry. Yeah, no, you're welcome. I enjoyed it too. So I wish you both well on your journey. And yeah, I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank All you. Right, thank you. All right then. Thank you so much to Stephen for joining us this week and we want to offer our biggest congratulations to you for reaching two years of sobriety. It's such a huge milestone in your journey and we are so inspired by your continued dedication and strength in the face of adversity. We have linked some resources that can offer help and advice with any of the issues we spoke about in our chat today in the description for anyone who needs it. Thank you so much for listening and until next week, Keep your head above the clouds.